In this exercise, we are asked which of these are statements. Now remember, a statement or a proposition is a sentence that we can assign to be true or false. So let's look at these, starting with A, 2 plus 3 equals 5. Yeah, that's a true statement. That is a statement. B says 2 plus 3 equals 6. Now this is false, and so it is a statement, right? We assign this to be false, and since we can do that, that tells us that this is a statement. C says, do your homework, Joel. Now this is not true or false, this is a command, right? So this is not a statement. D says Joel didn't do his homework. Now this is either true or it's false. So this is a statement. E says, is there life on Mars? Now that's not true or false, right? That's a question. So that's not a statement. And F is one of the simplest statements. F simply says false. And this is assigned the value false. So yes, it is a statement. G says, what Felix says is false. Now, is that a statement? Well, yeah, that can be true or false. And so it's a statement. And finally, H says, what this sentence says is false. Now, at first glance, this might look like a statement, but remember, for it to be a statement, we must be able to assign it true or false. So, suppose it's true, then what this sentence says is false, but we just said it's true. So that's a contradiction. Whereas, if we assign it to be false, then it is not the case that what this sentence says is false. Again, that's a contradiction. So in fact, we can't say that this is true or false. It's a paradox, and so it's not a statement. And we're done. So in this question, we're asking which of the following are statements, right? And remember, a statement is something which we can assign to be either true or false. Okay. So let's have a look at A. 17 is an odd integer. Well, yeah, of course, that's a statement, right? It's a true statement. That's irrelevant that it's true. It is a statement, okay? So let's look at B. 18 is an odd integer. Now you should not be thinking, well, no, it isn't, because you're right, but you're saying that it's false. So, yes, it's a statement. Melekeok is the capital of Palau. Now again, you should not be thinking, I don't know, I've never heard of Melikayok or Palau. They might not even be real places, right? Irrelevant. It's either true or it's false. So it's a statement. Let's look at D. Unload the dishwasher when it has completed its washing cycle. 
Well, no, that's not a statement. That's a command, right? That's something your mum would tell you to do. Not true or false. Not a statement. Next one. You should unload the dishwasher when it has completed its washing cycle. Well, yes, this one is a statement, right? It's true or false. You should unload it, or you shouldn't. It's a statement. Okay. Are all roses red? Well, no, that's a question, right? That's not a statement. Yes, all roses are red. Okay, that's a statement, right? It's not necessarily true. Not all roses are red, but it is a statement. And finally, stop. Well, again, that's a command, right? That's not true or false. Not a statement. In this exercise, we are asked to determine which of these are statements. And remember, a statement is something which we can assign to be either true or false. Right? So let's look at the first one. The iPad is a 16-bit computer. Yeah, this is a statement, right? Doesn't matter whether it's true or false. The fact that it is false means that it's a statement. B, there is a largest even number. Again, this is false. Doesn't matter that it's false. The fact that it is false means it's a statement. C, x plus y equals 15. Now, Without knowing the values of x and y, we cannot say whether this is true or false. And so this is not a statement. Whereas d, on the other hand, 8 plus 7 equals 13, we can say for sure that this is false. And so this is a statement. e says, pass me the salt. Now this is a demand, right? This isn't true or false. It's not a statement. And F, say what? Now that's an exclamation. It's not true or false. It's not a statement. In this exercise, we are asked to determine which of these are valid deductions. Let's look at the first one. If the fire alarm sounds, then everyone must leave the building. The fire alarm has sounded, therefore everyone must leave the building. Well, yeah, the fire alarm has sounded, and if the fire alarm sounds, then everyone must leave the building, so we can logically conclude that everyone must leave the building. And this is a valid deduction. What about the second one? 
Again, if the fire alarm sounds, then everyone must leave the building. The fire alarm has not sounded, therefore no one must leave the building. Now is this a valid deduction? Well, no. There might be other reasons for people to leave the building. It's not the case that just because the fire alarm has not sounded, then no one must leave the building. There's all kinds of reasons for people to leave the building. So this is not a valid deduction. And finally, if the fire alarm sounds, then everyone must leave the building. Everyone must leave the building. Therefore, the fire alarm has sounded. Is this a valid deduction? Well, no. Again, there could be another reason why everyone must leave the building. Maybe it's just closing time. We cannot logically conclude that since everyone must leave the building, the fire alarm has sounded. So this is not a valid deduction. And we're done. We have been asked to determine whether this is a logically valid deduction. And this exercise is not a test of your prior chess knowledge. Okay? You don't need to know anything about chess in order to make deductions based on rules that you are given. Right? So let's read. Our first statement says the right for castling with a particular rook has been lost if the king has already moved or the rook in question has already moved. One of the two rooks has already moved. Therefore, the right for castling with the rook in question has been lost. Now, is this a valid deduction? Well, we're only told that one of the two rooks has already moved. We don't know that the rook in question has moved, right? And so we can't logically deduce that the right for castling with the rook in question has been lost. So this is not a valid deduction. Okay. Now, consider this slight tweak on the second statement. Now, we are told that both rooks have already moved and we're given the same rule about when we lose the right for castling. Now this time, this is a valid deduction, right? Since both rooks have already moved, we know that in particular, the rook in question must have moved. And so yes, we can deduce that the right for castling with the rook in question has been lost. Okay, now consider this. Now we are given a slightly different rule, right? We're told only that the right for castling with a particular rook has been lost if the king has already moved, right? And we know that both rooks have already moved. And the conclusion is that therefore the right for castling with the rook in question has been lost. Now remember, this isn't testing your chess knowledge, right? We're using only the rule that we are given. And we are not told that the right for castling is lost if the rook has moved, right? We're only told that the right for castling has been lost if the king has moved. And we are not told that the king has moved. So we cannot logically conclude that the right for castling with the rook has been lost. So this is not a valid deduction.
Consider this argument. It is unlawful for any person to keep more than three dogs and three cats on their property within the city. Charles keeps five dogs but no cats on his property in the city. Therefore, Charles is breaking the law. Is this a valid deduction? Well, it might be valid or invalid, depending on your interpretation. The language used here, and in particular the use of the word and, is ambiguous. Charles could argue in the court of law that he is not breaking the law, since he is not keeping more than three dogs and more than three cats on his property. Now it is vitally important in software engineering, and in particular in the requirements engineering process, in which you elicit from your customer what they need the software to do, that such ambiguity in the use of informal language is avoided. Anne is looking at Bob, and Bob is looking at Carol. Anne is married, while Carol is unmarried. Can we determine whether or not a married person is looking at an unmarried person? Now we don't know whether or not Bob is married, but he certainly is either married or unmarried. If Bob is unmarried, then there is a married person looking at an unmarried person, namely Anne looking at Bob. On the other hand, if Bob is married, then again there is a married person looking at an unmarried person, this time Bob looking at Carol. So the answer is yes. We can determine that there is a married person looking at an unmarried person. Interestingly, in controlled tests, most people fail to see this. It appears at first as if there is not enough information to answer the question. It seems to rely on whether or not Bob is married, but this is not the case. This exercise was created and taught by Lewis Carroll. Now we all know Lewis Carroll from his surreal stories, but you may not know that his real name was Charles Dodson and he was an Oxford maths professor. He often taught logic using puzzles involving characters he invented, such as this one. Now from these statements, Lewis Carroll concludes that Amos Judd loves cold mutton. So let's see how he got there. Statement C tells us Amos Judd has never been in prison. Statement G says men with short hair have all been in prison. Now Amos Judd, having never been in prison, cannot have short hair. So he has long hair. Now statement B says no man with long hair can fail to be a poet. Amos Judd has long hair, so he cannot fail to be a poet. In other words, he is a poet. Now statement E says none but policemen on this beat are poets. So since Amos Judd is a poet, he must also be a policeman. 
statement A says all the policemen on this beat sup with our cook. Amos Judd is a policeman, so he sups with our cook. Now statement F says none but a cousins ever sup with our cook. Amos Judd sups with our cook, so he must be the cook's cousin. And finally, statement D says our cook's cousins all love cold mutton. Amos Judd is the cook's cousin, and so Amos Judd loves cold mutton. Now this exercise highlights how many different ways there are in English of saying very similar things. You'll see that all of these statements are just examples of implications, right? If then statements. So, if someone is our cook's cousin, then they love cold mutton, for example. In this exercise, we have to determine which of these are well-formed formulae and which are not. First of all, not P and Q is fine. That's a well-formed formula. B is not P, comma, Q and R. Now, commas are not used in propositional logic. And this is not a well-formed formula. C is Q, not P and Q. Now the not operator does not link two statements. It's only put at the front of a statement. So there's something missing here, perhaps an and or an or. This is not a well-formed formula. And finally, P and Q implies P or Q. Nothing wrong with that. That's a well-formed formula. And we're done. In this exercise, we want to determine which of these are well-formed formulae and which are not. First up, not, not P or not, not R. Yep, nothing wrong with that. That's a well-formed formula. Secondly, not P, Q, not R. Now, commas are not used in propositional logic, so this is not a well-formed formula. C is P and not P. That's a perfectly well-formed formula. And finally, P and Q, P or Q. Now, uh, there's something missing in the middle here, perhaps an and or an or. It is not a well-formed formula. And we're done. In this exercise, we want to determine which of these are well-formed formulae and which are not. First up, P implies Q, implies Q implies P. Nothing wrong with that, and the parentheses match up evenly, so it's a well-formed formula. And we can draw its syntax tree.
the middle implies is the least binding, and we get P implies Q implies Q implies P. Now this statement can be rewritten using fewer parentheses. So this has the same meaning as our original statement. This is because the operators are applied right to left. So you can imagine here that if we were to evaluate this, then it would be the same as evaluating with the parentheses here. We apply right to left, and we still need the first parentheses, because if they weren't there, we would be applying right to left, so we would apply this implies first followed by this. Next, statement B is P or Q and P. Now this in the parentheses is not a statement, right? And P. So that can't be evaluated. This is not a well-formed formula. C is P or Q and P. Nothing wrong with that. It's a well-formed formula. Let's draw its syntax tree. So the and is the least binding here. And we get P or Q and P. Now consider this statement. P or Q and P, this time without the parentheses. Now remember that the AND operator is more tightly binding than the OR operator. So if we were to evaluate this statement, we would in fact be evaluating P or Q and P. And this is not what we want. So in fact, this statement is written with minimal parentheses. Finally, let's look at D. This says P or Q if and only if R not S. Now this is not a well-formed formula for a couple of reasons. First of all, not can only be put in front of a statement. It does not join two statements. So there's something missing here, perhaps an and or an or. Secondly, there are too many closing parentheses in this statement. We have closing, 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 three closing, but only two opening. So they're not matched. And this is not a well-formed formula. And we're done. In this exercise, we are tasked with expressing these statements in English, where P represents the statement, I bought a lottery ticket, and Q represents the statement, I won the jackpot. So let's look at A, not P. So not, I bought a lottery ticket, or I did not buy a lottery ticket. B says P or Q. So I bought a lottery ticket or I won the jackpot. C says P and Q. So I bought a lottery ticket and I won the jackpot. D says P implies Q, or if P, then Q. So we might say, if I bought a lottery ticket, 
then I won the jackpot. E says not P implies not Q, or if not P, then not Q. So if I did not buy a lottery ticket, then I did not win the jackpot. And finally, F says not P or P and Q. So either I did not buy a lottery ticket or I bought a lottery ticket and won the jackpot. In this exercise, we have two defined propositional variables. T stands for the statement taxes will go up, and D stands for the statement the deficit will go up. Our task is to translate these three propositional formulae into natural English. Formula A is T or D. That's simple enough. So that says either the taxes will go up or the deficit will go up. Formula B is a bit more complex. It says not T and D and not not T and not D. So it is not the case that both taxes and the deficit will go up, and it is not the case that both taxes and the deficit will not go up. So a more natural way to say this might be taxes and the deficit will neither both go up nor both not go up. Statement C formula C is T and not D, or D and not T. So either the taxes will go up, but the deficit will not, or the deficit will go up, but taxes will not. Again, either taxes will go up, but the deficit will not, or the deficit will go up, but taxes will not. And we're done. In this exercise, we express these four statements as propositional formulae. Starting with statement A, which says, Alice and Bob are not both telling the truth. So it is not the case that both Alice and Bob are telling the truth, which can be written like this. So here the variable A represents the statement Alice is telling the truth and the variable B represents the statement Bob is telling the truth. So this says it is not the case that Alice and Bob are both telling the truth. All right, statement B says Alice and Bob are both not telling the truth. 
So this is a very different statement, all right? This time, both Alice and Bob are not telling the truth. So it is not the case that Alice is telling the truth, and it is not the case that Bob is telling the truth. And here is the propositional formula for that statement. Not A and not B. Thirdly, we have the statement, either Alice or Bob is not telling the truth. Right. So, either Alice is not telling the truth, or Bob is not telling the truth. And in the language of propositional logic, we have not A or not B. Now notice that while this statement is a different statement to statement A, they actually have the same meaning, right? Alice and Bob are not both telling the truth, and either Alice or Bob is not telling the truth. They both mean the same, but they are different statements. Uh, statement D says neither Alice nor Bob is telling the truth. So Alice is not telling the truth and Bob is not telling the truth. So again we have not A and not B. And we're done. In this exercise, we're given three propositional variables. S stands for the statement, you must be smart. H stands for you must be hardworking. And O stands for you must be overconfident. Our task is to express this statement in propositional logic. You must either be smart or hardworking, but not overconfident. Now, the first part of the statement is pretty easy. You must either be smart or hardworking. S or H. Right, S or H. You must either be smart or hardworking. Okay, carrying on. But not overconfident. So the but here, that acts as an and, right? This is saying you must either be smart or hardworking, and also you must not be overconfident. So we'll have an and not O. But we're not quite finished. Reading this, this says S or H and not O. Now the and operator binds more tightly than the or operator. So the way we would really be reading this is either you must be smart or you must be both hardworking and not overconfident. And this doesn't quite have the same meaning as our English statement. We want to say that you must either be smart or hardworking and you must not be overconfident. Adding parentheses here gives us that meaning. S or H and not O. And we're done.